It's time to talk about June's Journey, a hidden object mystery game with a captivating detective story. When you're playing, you solve a mind-teasing mystery of the roaring 1920s while you dive into June's captivating quest to uncover a scandalous family secret and solve her sister's murder. It's mystery, it's danger, and it's romance, and you never know where the next chapter's gonna take you. If that wasn't fun enough, you get to customize your very own luxurious island estate. Seriously, I cannot stop playing. I am already on the third chapter, and I just started recently. Join me back in time in the glamorous 1920s. June needs your help, detective. Download June's Journey for free today on iOS and Android. You wanted to see me, Miss Swinton? Have you been hearing about the new government modernization efforts? AI, RPAs, data science. Things are changing at this agency, and people will need new skills. Oh. I'd like you to get some training. Huh. Look at this management concepts catalog. Wow, over 275 courses. That's right, in local classrooms or instructor-led online classes. We still have budget in this fiscal year, so sign up online. Advance your career with courses from Management Concepts. Get a catalog at managementconcepts.com or call 833-578-8466. You know by now patrons heard this first. When you join, you get episodes one day early, a bonus episode every month, priority when requesting a case, and a shout out on an episode. Speaking of, thanks Jeannie and Corinne. To join the Patreon, click the link in our show notes. We can't wait to have you as one of our Patreon besties. Hey, I'm Paige. And I'm Natalie. We're the hosts of the Murder Diaries podcast. We bonded over tacos and true crime after we matched on Bumble BFF. You know, like any normal millennial using an app to meet new friends. Every Thursday, we upload a new episode. In each episode of the Murder Diaries, we tell true crime one story at a time. One week, it's my turn. And the next week, it's mine. For this week's episode, we're talking about Amy Harwick, who was a marriage and family therapist by day and a go-go dancer and fire breather by night. Her lifestyle was unique. She might be fire breathing as a gig for a party at night and lecturing at a university the next morning. She dedicated her life to helping others. Needless to say, she had many, many layers and a colorful life. Dealing with an ex turned stalker was one of the darker parts of her life. While they were dating, she endured violence at his hands. Post breakup, he tormented her, breaking in while she wasn't home and making fake social media accounts to harass her but Amy was never able to prove for sure it was him at the time. She continued to live her life the best she could. She followed everything she would have advised one of her clients. Her home was even equipped with a security camera and a security gate. Unfortunately, Amy's life was taken from her just after Valentine's Day of 2020, but her legacy lives on. This is her story. You still think it's in my head I'm walking with the dead. Amy Nicole Harwick was born May 20th, 1981. She was raised in Lansdale, Pennsylvania after being adopted by Penny and Tom Harwick. Later, Amy would spend some time in the foster system. We were lucky enough to speak with Amy's best friend, Robert. And when we did, he mentioned that she didn't talk much about this time in her life. Honestly, for Amy, this doesn't have much to do with her important stories that her loved ones want told anyways. At the end of the day, whatever happened with Amy's time in the foster system, she shared the Harwick last name with her adoptive parents and her brother Chris in life and death. A colleague of Amy's, Hernando, calls her a helper, a healer. This colleague also describes that Amy had, quote, a deep compassion and empathy, end quote. Another friend, Ashley, says, quote, you were never bored around her. As she grew up in Pennsylvania, she attended North Penn High School and graduated from there in 1999. She soon after moved to the L.A. area with a man she was married to, a musician named Tommy. He had a son, and for that time, Amy was a devoted stepmother to them. Robert told us in our conversation with him that Amy rarely talked about the past, but that this marriage was, quote, pivotal. She always spoke fondly of her ex-husband and she stayed friends with him. Robert even went on to tell us that her ex-husband was one of the few people she stayed close to after being in a relationship with. Is your daily grind getting you down? A Thermospas hot tub may be the solution. Just a few minutes under those powerful soothing jets and all your stress seems to melt away like you're lying on a cloud of bubbles. You'll not only feel better, but sleep better too. Call 877-861-4672 now. And for a limited time, save $1,250. Call 877-861-4672 or visit thermospas.com to schedule a free on-site assessment. 
Is your daily grind getting you down? A Thermospas hot tub may be the solution. Just a few minutes under those powerful soothing jets and all your stress seems to melt away like you're lying on a cloud of bubbles. You'll not only feel better but sleep better too. Call 877-861-4672 now and for a limited time save $1250. Call 877-861-4672 or visit thermospas.com to schedule a free on-site assessment. While living in LA, Amy earned her bachelor's of psychology from Cal Poly Pomona, which is one of the three polytechnic universities in the California State University system. After getting her bachelor's, she advanced her education at Pepperdine University in LA, earning a master's in clinical psychology with a focus on marriage and family therapy. This is the typical requirement to become what you think of when you think of a therapist. There are, of course, different types of therapists and licenses out there, but this is the type of therapist or credential that you would want to go to when you're looking to work on social or relationship issues. This isn't where it ended with Amy's education. She went on to earn a PhD in human sexuality from the Institute for Advanced Studies of Human Sexuality. A little bit about this more alternative institute. It closed in 2018, and it wasn't regionally or nationally accredited, as her previous universities were where she got her other degrees. This institute was, however, approved by the State of California Bureau for Private Post-Secondary Education. In essence, this means that this institute didn't get any federal funding and their students couldn't either. It definitely doesn't mean that Amy didn't work hard for her PhD or that she wasn't an expert in her field. It's just important to note it here when we're talking about how her PhD came from a more alternative institute like this. In a 2014 article for xbiz.com about the institution, the founder, Ted, is quoted saying, quote, we don't take federal money and that's why we won't be accredited by the traditional state agencies. We don't want to be handcuffed as to what we can provide, say, and do. The founder explains further, stating that they had been approached by accrediting bodies, but they were asked to compromise parts of their codes of ethics and asked to make other changes that the Institute just wasn't willing to make. Quote, we won't do it, end quote. Along with this advanced education in the psychology field, Amy had interests and skills in the performance arts, too. She was a talented model, dancer, and photographer. Something really, really cool that Amy did was perform at parties with fire and batons. Amy's best friend, Robert, told 48 Hours, quote, she had a magic that few people possess. She was a superstar, end quote. In 2012, Dr. Amy Harwick began interning under a supervising therapist called Mo. Mo calls Amy, quote, super positive and recalls for 48 Hours that she was very fascinated with and passionate about the field of psychology and mental health. This internship really launched Amy's career. In her internship practice, Amy was specializing in, quote, relationships and sex therapy, end quote. According to Mo, Amy wanted to destigmatize, quote, the way we see sexuality. She really wanted to normalize it, end quote. Another piece about Amy and her work is, quote, she was passionate about people that get marginalized by society, sex workers in particular, end quote. Before too long, Amy was able to start her own therapy practice in West Hollywood. She was clearly driven, and Mo says, quote, this girl had so much energy, it was incredible, end quote. Knowing that, it makes sense that on top of her therapy practice, Amy started a YouTube channel on March 30th, 2016. On the notion of social media, a fun fact that I so loved learning about when I was researching Amy's case is that in 2014, she had also started an Instagram for her blue-eyed ragdoll cat, Marquita Chat. Please excuse any mispronunciation. This account is still active, so you can check out the Marquis and how cute he is. He lives with his Pomeranian friend, Miss Maple Leaf, in the historic Harris House, which is the breathtaking, quote, transitional Victorian home in Glendale that's available for filming and photo shoots. This really warmed our animal-loving hearts. Back to Amy's YouTube channel, she can be found informing viewers on things like, quote, jealousy is not love, end quote. And her videos range from, quote, how to cope with the fear of flying to what you can learn from BDSM and kink. She was always encouraging her viewers and followers not to be ashamed and to reach out for help when they needed it. To understand more about Amy's case and story, we need to go back a few years from this point, back to 2011. It's around this time that she was dating a man named Gareth Pursehouse. 48 Hours called him a, quote, wannabe comedian, software engineer, and photographer. 
while the two were dating, it got toxic. Gareth turned violent and abusive. Amy confided in her best friend one time that the two were fighting and Amy threw a pillow at him. A pillow. Gareth retaliated to this pillow being thrown at him by hitting Amy and, quote, bashing her head against the floor, end quote. By June of 2011, Amy had filed her first restraining order against Gareth. On the document, she lists Gareth as ex-boyfriend. The pair was broken up at this time. Amy also wrote on this document that one time, Gareth picked up Amy late at night and they got into a fight while he was driving. This fight escalated to the point that Gareth pushed her out of the car onto the side of the freeway. Amy goes on to allege that two months earlier, he had forced her onto the ground, covered her mouth to keep her from yelling, and kicked her. That restraining order came and went, and not long after, Amy was granted an additional temporary restraining order. This one ordered Gareth to stay 100 yards away from her at all times. In April of 2012, there was a hearing regarding this new restraining order, and the judge extended it to April of 2015. On this document, Amy indicates, quote, he has suffocated me, punched me, slammed my head on the ground, kicked me, end quote. She goes on to say, this has resulted in bruises, inability to walk, bleeding, broken blood vessels around face, whiplash, sore neck, and back. It's clear here the relationship was done. Amy moved on over the next several years, and in 2017, she met celebrity Drew Carey. A few weeks after the pair met, they ran into each other at a party. Drew himself tells CBS the story of that night. He says that Amy told him, quote, it's my birthday and my boyfriend stood me up. Drew responds by saying, boy, you should get a better class of boyfriend. And she agrees. Yeah, maybe I should. Before the end of the night, Drew got Amy's number. They enjoyed their first date at Disneyland soon after and the rest was history. Drew recalls again for CBS about telling his friends and family about he and Amy's budding relationship. Quote, I said, wow, I met this great girl. Her name is Amy. She's a PhD and she's a therapist. And I said, if this keeps going the way it's going, I'm going to marry her. I just said it right out. And I'd only known her for like a couple of weeks. I just knew that she was special. In January of 2018, Drew and Amy announced their engagement. But by November of 2018, they had called their 10-month engagement off. Drew doesn't go into too much detail about why the engagement was called off, and rightfully so. This relationship was important and impactful for both him and Amy. Drew does mention, however, that Hollywood had a role in the breakup, and he calls the breakup, quote, really painful, and he likens it to a death. The pair definitely had their time in the tabloids. This really stressed Amy out because she felt like it could trigger her ex, Gareth. She wasn't sure if it was him, but every time Amy and Drew were in the headlines, someone was online trying to damage her reputation. She couldn't prove it exactly, but she felt like she knew it was Gareth. 15 months after their breakup, Amy texted Drew in an effort to plan a time they could meet up and talk. This is a conversation, unfortunately, Amy would not live to have as she was murdered just two short days later. Before we get there, though, let's back up to a month before that, January 2020. Amy attended the Expiz Awards on Thursday, January 16th at downtown LA's JW Marriott Live Hotel. The event that Amy was attending is an annual award ceremony for the adult industry. Expiz calls their award ceremony, quote, the adult industry's biggest night. Amy was attending that night thanks to free tickets that she received for charity work that she did for adult performers. While enjoying the night at the award ceremony, Amy ran into Gareth. It's a little bit unclear from the resources, but he was seemingly covering this event as a photographer. It had been eight years since they had seen each other. Gareth approached her and Amy responded kindly at first. Gareth was clearly, quote, upset, agitated, and distressed, according to 48 Hours and LA Times states that he was, quote, furious and weepy. Amy spoke with him as he sobbed and fell into the fetal position. The two ended up having basically an impromptu therapy session. However, Amy, quote, soon came to see him as a threat to her safety, as the LA Times puts it. Gareth had begun to yell at her, and he created a scene, quote, reciting text messages from 2012 and screaming to Amy that she had ruined his life. Soon after the awards event, Amy texted a friend. She said, quote, Gareth found my number online and he messaged me. She continues on, quote, he keeps texting and sounds unstable, end quote. Colleague Arnando says that at this time, Amy was, quote, scared of the what ifs, end quote. 
After this encounter, she began to share her phone location with her best friend, Robert. And Robert mentions this in his conversation with us and with 48 Hours. Robert also recalls that Amy told him, quote, if anything ever happens to me, it's him, end quote. Unfortunately, that intuitive warning, that fear, came true. On Valentine's Day 2020, Amy started her day with a planned sunrise hike in the Hollywood Hills and breakfast with her friend Cleopatra. I'm going to quote here Cleopatra directly from her CBS News interview. So I got to her house. She invited me in because she still hadn't gotten ready yet. We went up to her bedroom, which was very beautiful. It had a nice balcony, all this natural light. And she was frantically getting ready. And at the last minute, she grabbed this little red cardigan sweater and said, it's Valentine's Day. I'm just going to throw this on. During the hike, Amy took time to talk about the history of the neighborhood and point out landmarks, really soaking it in while sharing her vast knowledge she had of the area. After the hike, Amy and Cleopatra ate breakfast at Hollywood Hills Neighborhood's Beachwood Cafe. Cleopatra, again for CBS News, says, quote, she talked a lot about how happy she was, how... She felt really accomplished and happy with where she was in life and very much like at peace, end quote. Later that night, Amy got dressed up to go to the Globe Theater to see a burlesque show with some friends at 7 p.m. She was decked out in her rosary necklace, a black leather jacket, boots, and a blush-colored velvet dress. She paired this with a deep mauvey lip and her hair in a big high bun that was wrapped in a braid at the base. She looked stunning. After the show, her friends headed to the Nomad Hotel downtown, just 0.3 miles away to hang out and have some tea before heading home around 12.18. It's now February 15th, 2020. Amy made it home around 1 a.m. And before she called in the night, she texted her friend asking her to send pictures from that night. Quote, send me pics from the green couch. It's time stamped February 15th, 1.02 a.m. Soon after this, Amy's roommate was awoken by screams and the sound of, quote, bodies falling to the floor and more screams that seemed muffled as though someone had put a hand over her mouth, end quote. An intruder had been waiting for an estimated four hours for Amy to come home before he attacked. The roommate, now awake, tried to scare the intruder off by yelling, but then decided it was better to run for help. At 108, he ran across the street to get that help, but no one answered the door. Not long after, at 1.14 a.m., he flagged down a passerby, and he was able to use their phone to call 911. When police arrived, they found Amy laying 20 feet below her third-floor bedroom's balcony. She was still alive, but struggling to breathe. At 2.26, the picture Amy asked her friend for on the green couch from that night came through, but Amy would never see it. She passed away at 3.26 a.m. at Cedar sinai Hospital. Left behind was evidence of a violent scene. Blood was left on the bedroom door. A trail of the rosary beads she wore that night went from the TV room all the way through her bedroom and on to the balcony. On the balcony, investigators recovered a syringe filled with liquid nicotine, which can be lethal. Investigators spoke with the roommate as well as her best friend, Robert. Robert smartly recalled that Amy was worried Gareth could do something horrible like this to her and told police about him and the previous abuse Amy had endured. 13 hours later, they arrived to Gareth's house and they charged him with Amy's murder. They even found a similar syringe to the one that they found on the balcony full of liquid nicotine. On February 17th, the coroner ruled Amy's death a homicide. The autopsy found that Amy had injuries to her neck indicating strangulation. Injuries to her hands and fingers were also found, proving a struggle had happened before she was thrown off the balcony. According to the RAP, it's noted in the autopsy report that it was the blunt force trauma that was fatal. In April, Gareth pled not guilty. Five months later, in September, a hearing was held, and the judge hearing the case decided that there was enough evidence and that Gareth should stand trial despite the defense's attempt to paint a picture that Amy died from an accidental fall, not because of Gareth. The defense argued that Gareth had sufficient opportunity to use the syringe filled with that lethal amount of nicotine that he had left behind her house, but he didn't. The prosecution also has plenty of evidence, though, including DNA evidence on their side that Gareth is responsible for Amy's death. The trial has yet to start, but if convicted, Gareth could spend life in prison without the possibility of parole. Amy was laid to rest in Pennsylvania near her family. 
when we spoke to Robert, he let us know, though, that he's got a memorial project going on so that he can memorialize Amy here in California. The goal of this memorial is, quote, to create a life-size bronze memorial of Amy that will include a plaque that is dedicated to the women who have lost their lives to domestic violence. But it will also serve as a place to gather to find solace and also inspiration to live our lives as fiercely as she lived hers. This permanent memorial will be installed in the world famous Hollywood Forever Cemetery, which is in the heart of Hollywood. End quote. Getting a spot in Hollywood Forever is not surprisingly very expensive. And this memorial has become a life's work project for Robert. If you'd like to donate, you can do so by visiting amyharwickmemorial.com or click the links in our show notes. I want to note here as well that a new episode of 48 Hours on Amy's Case, season 35, episode 19, is premiering September 3rd. So we'll be tuning in for any updates. The episode will have already premiered by the time you're hearing this, but not while we're recording. So you can definitely go ahead and check out 48 Hours On Demand or wherever you catch 48 Hours and watch both episodes. We have the one that we used as a resource, of course, linked in our show notes. A final piece we really want to share on this episode is that when we spoke to Robert, he mentioned that Amy enjoyed true crime and would have loved our podcast. It meant so much to hear that, and we hope that we did Amy proud. With that, we'll let the unbelievably beautiful Amy sign us off. Until our next episode, you know where to find us. This is Dr. Amy Harwick. Until next time, have a great day. Seeking the truth never gets old. Introducing June's Journey, the free-to-play mobile game that will immerse you in a thrilling murder mystery. Join June Parker as she uncovers hidden objects and clues to solve her sister's death in a beautifully illustrated world set in the Roaring Twenties. With new chapters added every week, the excitement never ends. Download June's Journey now on your Android or iOS device or play on PC through Facebook games.